Next up on the agenda, we have another Odd Salon fellow, Eva Galperin, talking about the Capgrass delusion. Much further down. <laughs> so while I was uh, having drinks upstairs, uh, someone asked me, Eva, how did you get interested in neuroscience? And I told him, there was this boy. <laughs> I really liked him. And my way of getting to know a boy that I was starting to date is that I would read his entire bookshelf. Yeah. And this is how I read a lot of neuroscience books <laughs> and became essentially about undergraduate level prolific or proficient in, uh, in neuroscience. Uh, dear reader, I married that boy. <laughs> and he is a fellow at Odd Salon named John Adams. <laughs> Now let us begin. <laughs> to begin with, it is the Cap Gras delusion because it is French. <laughs> Our story begins with you, my reader. Uh, waking up in the morning, you get out of bed, you look in the mirror, you are exceptionally good looking. You get dressed, you make yourself a cup of coffee, your doorbell rings, it's your mom and dad. You've been expecting them. You open a door and dum, dum, dum. It's not them. Uh -oh. It's two people who look like your mom and dad. They seem nice and they act like they know you, but it's definitely not your mom and dad. Your parents are gone and they've been replaced by imposters. Is this the plot of Invasion of the Body Snatchers? Well, yes, uh, but it's also the Capgras delusion, known as the delusion of misidentification, first described by a grumpy mustache wearer and French psychiatrist, Jean-Marie Capgras, and his intern, Jean Raboula Chaux, not shown, uh, in a paper published in 1923, describing the case of Madame M. This is Madame X. Uh, standing in for Madame M, in a joke which will only be funny to our history nerds in the audience. <laughs> now, Madame Adam had a lot of problems. Evidently, she believed she was descended from King Henry IV, uh, but she was cheated out of a huge inheritance, which included 80 million francs and all of Rio de Janeiro, uh, by a bunch of spies that dyed her hair, used special drops to change the size of her eyes, and stole her breasts. But what got Capgras' attention was that for at least 10 years, Madame Anne had believed uh, that her husband and children had been replaced by doubles. She believed that her son had been replaced while he was away with his nurse and that her husband had been murdered only to be replaced by a series of others. She counted 80. In fact, she wanted a divorce from these imposters and had requested a separation from the courts. The Capgras delusion is limited to the people who are closest to the subject, the parents, the children, the partners, and pets. Cats and dogs have been the subject of the Capgras delusion. One patient famously believed that his poodle, Fifi, was an imposter. The real Fifi, he insisted, was living in Brooklyn. I do not have a slide of this, uh, of this Fifi wearing a hipster mustache. A woman suffering from Capgras believed that her beloved cat had been replaced by an imposter because she could detect changes in his meow. It does not extend to the merely familiar people you see every day. Um, the Capgras delusion does not usually extend to say the mailman unless your relationship with your mailman has taken a turn for the amorous. At the time it was first described, the Capgras delusion was believed to be a purely female disorder, symptomatic of schizophrenia, and often noted as a symptom of hysteria, which is early 20th century shorthand for woman's stuff we don't really understand but we think could be cured with vibrators. 
Doctors had a lot of weird Freudian explanations for why the Capgras delusion existed, mostly having to do with patients suddenly developing an overwhelming sexual attraction to their parents, which really doesn't explain the bit about the imposter pets. <laughs> It wasn't until the 80s and 90s that the doctors began to believe that the Capgras delusion was a neurological disease caused by changes to the brain. One particularly interesting aspect of Capgras is that the delusion only works when the patient is looking at pictures of his loved ones or meeting them face to face. On the phone, the patient believes he's talking to his real loved ones. This led scientists to look for damages to pathways concerned with visual recognition and emotions in the brain. And now it's time for some anatomy. So, that green thing up there, that's the temporal lobe. It contains the regions that specialize in face and object recognition. We know this because when people experience damage to the temporal lobe, they lose the ability to recognize faces, even those of close friends. If you've ever read Oliver Sacks' uh, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, I have now given away the premise. Spoilers. In a normal brain, the face recognition areas generate emotional responses to particular faces. Every time you see a face, your temporal cortex recognizes the image and passes the information to your amygdala, gateway to the limbic system. <laughs> That's that nut-shaped thing on the right. Uh, the, um, and this figures out the emotional significance of the face. So you see the face, and it makes you feel things. <laughs> Listen, I don't have a picture of your loved one, okay? <laughs> what you're experiencing right now is the opposite of that warm, fuzzy feeling you get when you look on the face of someone you love. In his book, Phantoms in the Brain, neuroscientist V.S. Ramachandran theorizes that a patient with Capgras delusion has a, dis uh, has a uh, disassociation between the area of the brain that recognizes the faces and the amygdala, which is responsible for that warm, fuzzy feeling you get when you looked at a loved one. Which brings us to the talking heads. So the patient looks at his beautiful wife, but does not feel the warm glow. And Ramachandran posits that the brain tries to solve this dilemma by assuming that this woman merely resembles the patient's wife, but she is an imposter. And that's a very interesting theory. But how do you test it out? With one of these. This is a galvometer. It's the same thing that's used in lie detector tests. It's Science. It's made up of electrodes on your hands that measure the changes in electrical resistance on your skin. When you're emotionally aroused, like when you see the face of a person who is important to you, the information travels from your face recognition uh, region to your limbic system, then to a tiny cluster of cells in the hypothalamus. Nerve fibers extend from the hypothalamus to the heart, muscles, and other parts of your brain, helping your body to take appropriate action. Your blood pressure will rise, and your heart will start beating faster and deliver more oxygen to your tissues, and you start to sweat. As predicted by prophecy, by which I mean hypothesis, by which I mean Dr. Hayden Ellis in 1997, the undergraduates, scientists experiment primarily on helpless undergraduates, showed a big jolt in their galvanic skin response to photos of their loved ones. Patients with Capgras delusion did not. But why is this delusion so powerful and persistent? Why can't the brain just dismiss them like deja vu? Uh, Nicola Edelston's brain scans of Capgras patients shed some light on this. Structural brain scans in these patients showed damage to the prefrontal co co uh, cortex, where goals, strategies, and decisions are made. Damage to these processes could conceivably result in a failure to realize that an anomalous experience, this person looks like my mom, but doesn't feel like my mom, uh, being generated is being generated internally rather than inflect, uh, reflecting changes in the external world. Coupled with a tendency to jump to conclusions, this paves the way for an abnormal belief to develop, take hold, and that is why it's so difficult for Capgra to be dismissed. While the belief that your loved one has been replaced by an imposter is the most common version of this delusion, in the 1980s, a Missouri man with Capgras delusion was con so convinced that his stepfather was a robot, he decapitated the man and dug through his severed neck, looking for the robot's batteries and microfilms. <laughs> no, he didn't find it. 
Capgras patients even sometimes duplicate themselves. Ramachandran uh, relates a case study of a patient who recognized himself just fine in the mirror but could not recognize a photo of himself taken two years before the car accident that damaged his brain. That's another Arthur, said the patient. He looks just like me, but he isn't me. You see, he has a mustache and I don't. William Hurstein expanded on the theory that he and Ramachandran came up to, with together. Uh, this gives a much more specific explanation that fits well with what uh, the patients actually say. He said, we represent the people we know well with hybrid representations containing two parts. One part represents them externally, how they look, sound, etc., and the other part represents them internally, their personalities, beliefs, characterizations, emotions, preferences, etc. Capgra symptoms Occur, uh, Capgras syndrome occurs when the internal portion of the representation is damaged or inaccessible. This produces the impression of someone who looks right on the outside but seems different on the inside, an imposter. This also corrects the problem with the earlier hypothesis that there are many possible responses to a lack of emotion upon seeing someone. There are other related delusions that may stem from similar damage to the brain. For example, Cotard syndrome is a disorder in which the patient believes that they are already dead and putrefying, sometimes claiming to smell rotting flesh or maggots all over their skin. Uh, while Capgra is limited to facial recognition, neuroscientists believe that Cotard syndrome may result from all sensory areas being disconnected from the limbic system, leading to a complete lack of emotional contact with the world. This here is obviously an example of Frigoli syndrome in which you believe all faces are the same face. I like to call it Malkovich, Malkovich, Malkovich. <laughs> but let's take a moment now to raise a glass to the multiplicity of yous, to the weird and delicate nature of singular identity, and most of all, to that warm, fuzzy feeling you get when you look upon the face of someone you love. <laughs>